Chapter Fifteen of Lift Luck on Southern Roads by Tigner Edwards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Divided Ways the bright cold weather seemed now a settled permanent thing standing with my host next morning at the gate of the lone cottage on the downs the same impulse stopped us both on the brink of our leave-taking together we looked out over the plain where the sun was licking up the last of the dewdrops and melting the last violet mists from the hollows each struck dumb at the sheer beauty of the scene he was the first to break what must have been a longer silence than either of us knew he struck a match rather pessimistically i hate farewells he said there have been too many in my life so let us have none of them now and au revoir is nothing but a mockery we shall never meet again you know you say and no doubt with perfect sincerity that you will come back in the summer but you will not with busy men life is too short to admit of any wilful duplication of experiences you can afford neither to hark back nor to swerve from the course fate has set for you from birth to death the path of each worker in the world must follow a tangent the straight line that is the nearest way between two points and two straight lines can intersect only once though they stretch from infinity to infinity no we shall never meet again he gave me the friendliest of glances and turning went slowly back to his solitary den for my part i set off down the road in much the same frame of mind nor looked back until i was some half mile away thence i could see the little house against its dark backing of pine wood and the road beyond until it looped over the distant hill he had said the truth there was little likelihood of my returning this way and he i knew would never leave the spot for more than an hour or so our strangely variant lives had crossed once they would never cross again i pondered his story there by the lane side and the more i thought of it the more doubtful i became it was a piece of magnificent steadfastness admirable in itself and likely to send him to his death a saint but apart from its glamour i could only think of it as one of the worst forms of worldliness he was doing what he had no right to do giving up his whole life to an idea that however fine its fluorescence was rooted in nothing deeper than self a man strong in mind body estate knowledge of human affairs there he was moping uselessly in one little blind corner of the earth suffering to rust and run to waste qualities that might have helped thousands all was sacrificed to an object that even if triumphantly attained could be viewed only as a species of failure for what will it profit a man if he gain the one woman who is the world to him and lose all else no doubt standing there moralizing to the rooks and doors i was myself squandering that most precious and most transient of earthly possessions opportunity i might have gone back to him and stalwartly spoken my mind for all i knew his one chance of awakening lay in the din that i alone was like to bring about his ears yet the man had been chastened cruelly unjustifiably as it might well seem in the depths of his misery he had elected to choose his own redeemer false or true 
i was in no sort of misgiving that it would purge him into a sanctity and pureness of life that in itself might deserve eternal profit but if we once begin to justify means by ends we admit all sorts of new unknown factors into the equation of life rendering a solution already complicated well-nigh impossible i set down these thoughts not because of any profoundness or novelty they may possess but because they are thoughts that actually occur to me at the moment that i did not go back but went forward on my own business was due curiously enough to the act of the very man in whose concern they were exercised coming to a shoulder in the road whence it ran steadily down over steps of hills into the blue distance i turned again for a last look at my night quarters i noticed at once a dark object by the lane side in front of the house then i saw two men come out to the gate one of whom approached the object which i now guessed to be some sort of tricycle and came riding towards me the other man stopped by the gate shading his eyes as the tricycle drew nearer i made out its rider to be a postman he pulled up as he reached my side he was a lean wiry old man with a face all but hidden in a mass of white hair and whisker are ye for pitton he asked because if you're goin thereby mr blank yonder thought as maybe you'd like to ride i looked at the machine and understood the joke i judged it to be between thirty and forty years old it was long and narrow it had a single large spider wheel on one side and two very small wheels on the other it was a double affair there was a broad cushioned seat on which two riders could sit back to back propelling the machine by stamping alternately on levers which rose and fell underneath it looked enormously heavy somewhere between two and three hundred weight as near as i could tell do you manage this by yourself i asked doubtfully the old man chirped like a wren ay and had done these five and twenty year tis wonderful fast considerin when ye lays into it ordinary and with two well i'll just show ye pitton was a good four miles off and we did it just under the hour i'm inclined to rank that hour's work as among the hardest in my life the old postman bent over his pedals his elbows high in air and seemed thereby to get a purchase denied to the back rider for myself having but one handle to hold by and the seat possessing a dangerous slope to the rear i was hard put to it to keep on the machine at all leaving out of account that the pedals were as elusive and slippery as eels on the whole i was not sorry when we came into pitton and were obliged to walk the old postman peddling his letters from door to door and i pushing the tricycle we were to part company at the crossroads at the top of the hill the old man had preserved a midwinter coolness throughout the whole journey but for me it had become a hot and dusty summer's day i looked all ways in quest of an inn sign but nothing of the kind was visible how i asked do the people manage here if they happen to be thirsty the old man pointed to a very innocent-looking cottage ye may try said he a tisanal license and ye'll get never a drop i knocked at the door hard heart in the guise of a stout comely old lady open to my summons and was affably adamantine i tried all inducements but in vain 
ye can't have it in your bare hands said she rather obviously where be your jug na na i durstn't lend you northen tis too dangerous whereupon she closed the door in my face i was coming back to the postman disconsolately when a little boy turned the corner carrying a milk can milk was a poor substitute truly in wiltshire the very home of good ale but the old tricycle had served me a sorry turn i held up a bargaining sixpence in the little boy's face to my surprise however his round eyes filled with disappointment tis empty he wailed and to farm be a mile away the old postman chuckled tis no good said he ye must buy dry till ye gets to winterslow he had yet to learn the resources of the needy here's the sixpence said i to the desperate youngster and now let me have the can for five minutes postman shall it be ale or beer once clear of pitton i found that i had seen the last of the wiltshire downs the country swiftly resumed its old luxuriant character and autumn blazed up again on every side once more the rustle of dry leaves underfoot mocked the wind in the thicket the whole way to winterslow was submerged in leaves and the sunny air full of their glancing colours between the villages i met not a soul and saw no living thing but birds and rabbits it was only two or three miles but i spent a good two hours in covering the distance i found that by walking on the soft turf under the hedgerows i could get along quite silently without bestowing any care on the matter and so came upon many a familiar but perennially interesting thing i remember this lane chiefly for its abundance of scarlet berries and the amazing strife of the birds around me as i went one would have thought that where there was such great plenty of food for all comers each would take his fill in peace but this was not so the lane was like a battlefield i moved in a continual hubbub of aggression creeping along under the shady side of the hedge i was in a constant whirl of fluttering wings and vociferous music blackbirds charged clattering out on every side wild with excitement song thrushes darted hither and thither a cloud of smaller birds finches for the most part swept on before me rending the air with their various notes of combat or alarm and above it and through it all the harsh grating battle cry of the missile thrush pealed out he indeed was the prime cause of all the disturbance the missile thrush is the bully of the hedgerows being the largest and strongest and most pugnacious of the company he naturally does not hold with the ancient principle of live and let live he is free to take now all he wants from the laden hedges and none can prevent him but that is not enough for the greedy missile his design and that of his fellows is to take forcible possession of the common larder of the countryside and to hold it against all weaker birds this selfish policy succeeds while the weather remains warm and other sources of food are available but directly the cold bright days of autumn set in other birds must crowd to the buried hedgerows or run the risk of starvation through sheer weight of numbers and by dint of repeated quick raids from all directions at once most of them contrive to snatch a meal from the bush under the very eyes of its raging custodian but it is hard and hot and exciting work while it lasts and for none more than the missile thrush himself 
almost his whole day at this time of year is spent in scolding at intruders or making headlong rushes after retreating foes as the alarm spread at my approach first the weaker combatants made off and then the missile thrushers themselves but their rasping notes did not cease even then each came storming out of the thicket on the farther side just ahead of me and off to the shelter of the nearest tree until i had passed on or sometimes they winged straight up into the blue and hovered there lark high until they were free to get back to their misbeholden treasures he that goes about the countryside on tiptoe prying into holes and crannies undoubtedly sees more of wild life than one who is content with an ordinary stroll through the woods and lanes trusting to the chance revelation of the moment but to me at least the great charm of nature has always been not her most secret most hidden aspects but her unceasing repetition of old known sights and sounds to steal about straining eyes and ears for rare events is often to destroy the very spirit of the morning throughout the rest of that idle saunter by field and covert the only things that really mattered to me were that the sun shone the birds sang the year was in the full red flush of its down going we all live for the moment at such a time bird and man and creeping thing at all other seasons much of our pleasure is derived from the thought that good as things are there are better to come but now our joy pivots on forgetfulness of the bleak and barren morrow i wandered on through sun and shadow from one leafy covert to another taking my fill of music and light and warm shelter as though each step were the last in plenty and the next would bring me out on the desert of wintry winds and loveless gloom and cold to spend an hour in winter slow and never once think of hazlitt or the lambs must seem little short of a crime to the literary reader but that is what happened to me and will probably happen again if ever i retrace that day's tortuous route the truth is that winterslow puts the wayfarer under an immediate and all-sufficing spell of its own there is a present-day enchantment in the place that annihilates all thought of times foregone the living people there are so engrossingly attractive that it never occurs to you to ponder over the dead ones famous or obscure it is a vortex of rural peace and quiet or rather a dimple in the pool just serving to mark the vital difference between progress and stagnation i came into the beautiful old-world settlement of winterslow well prepared as the overture prepares one for grand opera in a field not far from the village some sheep were folded and stopping to listen to the bells i was immediately struck by the pureness of their tone the ordinary sheep bell is a kind of inverted brazen can but the bells of this fold were real bells both in shape and quality the bells on a farm usually belong to the shepherd and are handed down from father to son in the common calling some sets are of great age as i judge these to be but there was no shepherd to inquire of the fold was in charge of a shaggy grey dog who though he looked as if he were full of information failed to enlighten me mainly because i could not understand his thunderous speech however i made out that he warned me to come no nearer so i contented myself with leaning over the gate and listening to the wayward melody of the fold 
silvery and slow in the noontide sun the sound crept over me and i thought i had never heard a sweeter strain the notes ran through a full octave up and down now in clanging peals of a score together and now in single tones like bells moved at random by the inconstant breeze and there was a sort of rhythm through it all almost a meaning there were sudden clear harmonies and pell-mell discords following them once and for a long time it seemed all the bells stopped together while one of the deepest tolled as regularly as if the sexton himself were at his rope and then all the bells came swinging in together the rich quiet notes overreaching one another like flood-tide ripples on a sandy shore i turned at last and went on to the village but the soft pealing stayed in my ears in fancy it returned to me all through the day and again in fancy i heard it far off as silvery and slow as ever when i woke in the night walled up in the queerest coziest nesting place that ever poor vagrant chanced upon but of that in its place my first impression of winterslow was as of a wide-spreading flower garden dotted over with gigantic brown toadstools and here and there a beehive fancifully shaped like a house but on a nearer view the toy houses became veritable human dwellings and the toadstools real cottages hiding under their thatch yet my main conception of the place as a garden remained to the end in the hour i spent there i saw more and finer flowers than i looked upon at any other spot in the five counties every cottage stood in its patch of rich-hued autumn blossom the sprawling scarlet of virginia creeper decked the walls ruddy apples shone aloft in the trees the favourite pampas grass lit many a nook with its cool silver roses met the eye at every turn in make-believe of june before i had been there five minutes i set winterslow down as a place where it never snowed nor gloomed nor blew cold i give it eternal sunshine unquestioningly just as surely as i know that the sky above it is always of the same cloudless blue that was a busy hour when i was tired of looking over garden gates at the lavish treasure beyond i had the smithy to inquire into to note the changing clang of the iron as it cooled under the hammer and learn the true voice of temper watch the sparks flying out of the shadow through the slant of sunshine into shadow again hearken to the wheezy bellows the growl of the fire the competition of uxorious barrows on the roof then there was a little red house half private dwelling half workshop the shop was carpeted in shavings full of a green light from ivy cumbered window panes and pervaded by a serious old man who quietly hammered at a bench he was not in the least perturbed when i came and silently looked in upon him like a village urchin i said after a while by way of greeting that it was good work this the contriving and fashioning in wood and he replied that it was indeed so provided that a man could get enough of it whereby to live then we went partnership in a full five minutes of congenial silence broken only by the tap of his hammer as he fed it with slender shining brass brads it was a workbox or some such woman's trifle that he was engaged upon i watched it grow together under his deft fingers helping him with mute commendation until he had got it into final shape 
and then he conveyed to me that he was glad of my assistance by reaching me down a rose from a glass on the window-sill i never liked to have them out of mind said he polishing busily i looked in at cottage doors with discreet and private eye in passing and browsed a while on the labels in the window of the village shop there were few men about these being at their labour in the fields but the women abounded all the older ones wearing the print sunbonnet last vestige of the national peasant costume i have often wondered at the strange coincidence yet it is nevertheless a fact that i never come into a village but i hit upon the one precious half-hour of the day when the women lay by work for a chat at the cottage door or flying interchange of news across the street so it again happened in winterslow they were all merrily at it as i sauntered through leaning out of window or door or gathered in little companies by the garden gates and while i stood listening to the murmur of voices soft or shrill the school door burst open like a dam and a rush of pinafores pink and white and blue all but swept me off my feet i turned eastward from winterslow at last with my rose nodding from my buttonhole and in my ears a medley of music bells and hammer the chippering of sparrows and children the sugared indolence of wiltshire country speech that noon i lunched by the wayside on apples and plum heavies an heroic meal with a robin perched on my boot toe whence he descended at intervals to recover errant crumbs so that you keep still or make but the most deliberate movement the robin whose private hedgerow quarters you may be sharing will always wait upon you thus the legend of ill luck to the molester of the robin or his nest is all but universal in the country he bears a charmed life and well he knows it he allows no liberties but permits himself many and a favourite perch of his is an outstretched human foot especially when the east wind chills the ground so there we sat my little scarlet waistcoated ballet and i for a full half hour until it became necessary to consult the map when at the unavoidable rustle and flourish of the sheet of paper he flew off scared and offended and i saw him no more i made the astonishing discovery as before it had happened to me that i was nearly out of the county though believing myself still in the heart of it in a mile or two at most i was to leave wiltshire behind and strike into hampshire and for the moment this came as much a grievance as a surprise round about winterslow you will find no fairer country in all southern england there is nothing wild about it and little that is imposing unless these qualities are taken piecemeal in the magnificence of its trees but it will charm the eye and comfort the mind at every turn there is a visible correspondence a sure fellowship between humanity and nature there for once the two seem to labour together for the common good and the sun to shine on something like the old edenic unity but i was to feel that more and more as the afternoon drew on to its golden closing and feel it in a remarkable way End of chapter fifteen Chapter Sixteen of Lift Luck on Southern Roads by Tickner Edwards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Lead Horse. The road now plunged into the woods. The lower branches everywhere were nearly bare of leaves, 
but the treetops being younger and more supple still held their full canopy aloft and through this natural roof the sunbeams filtered in glancing red and russet gold and grey the tree trunks were all of vivid green the grass beneath them greener still far overhead the wind sang shrilly but below hardly a leaf stirred into this quiet labyrinth of hollow ways i was followed presently by a clatter of hoofs three or four riders some soldiers and a groom with a led horse overtook and swept by me soon disappearing in the dusky depths of the wood ahead a little later however i came upon the groom again and this time alone his two horses were grazing by the roadside while the groom himself sat on a gate busily scribbling on his knee as i approached i saw him put up his pencil read over what he had written and then impatiently tear the paper to scraps he was letting the pieces slowly dribble through his fingers to the ground himself evidently lost in thought when my foot struck against a stone looking quickly round he caught sight of me it was a remarkable face he turned to mine all the more remarkable for the status of the man or rather the lithe youngster who bore it he could have been no more than eighteen or twenty years old he wore a suit of drab bedford cords buttoned in at the knee and in all other respects looked the groom and nothing more but the face was the grave refined clever face of the born cleric clear-cut delicately moulded with a pair of fearless grey eyes and a mouth faultlessly strong over a firm chin i could picture its owner as anything from deacon now to future archbishop and here he was exercising horses at perhaps fifteen shillings a week with at the utmost the prospect of being head coachman some day and a rich man's poor pensioner afterwards i pulled up as i came abreast of him with a casual question about the road and i may as well confess at once certain nebulous designs stirring within me at the sight of the two horses with only one rider but i had soon forgotten my own particular concerns in the new interest that his first words awakened not only his voice which was powerful and resonant but his accent and whole manner were of a piece with his face he spoke like a man of culture and with such unconscious ease and want that i found myself staring again and again at his groom's clothing with a greater wonder than ever yet there was something more about him which still farther interested me i found him very ready to talk for a long time we chatted together but the longer i stayed with him the more convinced i became that he was in some deep trouble or other it came out not in his words but in look pause gesture the hundred little ways that are alike nameless and indescribable yet not to be mistaken i looked at the torn paper on the road i thought of the boy's age and qualities of feature there was only one conclusion to be drawn as to the nature of his trouble and later so it was all revealed to me he was it seemed in that condition of mind familiar at some time to all of us when a confidence must be made if only to a brick wall or a stranger i moved to go 
whereupon i saw a sudden aversion to being left alone with his misery light up in his eyes and following it just as swift a signal of resolution he jumped down to his horses if you are going to tytherley he hesitated and won't mind riding on the cloth why i am going through there and myrtle will be all the better for someone to carry so the thing was going to happen as i hoped it would he gave me a leg up and i think i settled into place on myrtle's thoroughbred but providentially elderly back without disclosing my novitiate in one so absolutely ignorant of horsemanship the act was mere foolhardiness but fortune was hoodwinked she evidently mistook it for bravery and showered favour on me in the form of an exceedingly brilliant idea we are neither of us in a hurry said i suppose we turn into the woods and go by the bridle paths if there are any we need not move above walking pace that afternoon's ride all comes back to me now as though i were reading about it in the yellow dog-eared pages of some early victorian novel instead of trying to write of it in fresh wet ink from a twentieth century fountain pen the solemn deep light of the wood the green moss luminous under the hoofs of our pacing chargers the screaming jays the gambolling rabbits the pigeons cluttering noisily away through the red forest roof here and there a beam of sunshine full of midges or a pheasant running and calling in the secret brightness of some far-off glade or the sound of a stoat hunting or a rustle of birds in the wind but above all i remember the boy's rapt sorrowful face the dumb spell that held him for half the ride and then his broken beginning i i wanted to ask i was thinking whether you would mind if i asked your advice about about something he stopped and cut at a green bramble spray with his whip i could not see yet how to help him it is about about a young lady a girl he continued desperately do you think they always mean what they say this was a vastly more difficult problem than i had expected i played for time for consideration well of course it depends on two things what is said and who it is that says it then oh but she is a girl of good education made of good stuff through and through there is no one like her no not one he cried proudly a bright spot glowing up in the tan of his cheek i thought it over a little watching him the while suppose you tell me what she said then i can hardly advise you without knowing it is all about position social position you know her father is the postmaster at littlecot near winchester and i am only a common stableman she says if i will give up and go into something better she will she will think about what i what i asked her light seemed to dawn on the matter here well i answered him that seems very reasonable if you can only do it have you any plans is there no one you know who can help you to get something a little a little i know what you mean he caught me up a little more respectable but my father is a coachman and i would not hurt him for any woman besides it isn't anything that will do for clara she has her ideas or at least i think 
but that is what is so worrying the truth is i believe i have a chance with her in only one way and that said i as he hesitated go for a soldier he had turned his face away still averting his eyes he went on confusedly there's dick transome in the rifles he's always over there you know and just because of the uniform and dick's flash and dash it's my only chance i know well it shall be the guards or dragoons for me something with plenty of scarlet and brass in it that will put out the gravel crusher's green as you can snuff a candle yes that's the only thing and the sooner the better the path was narrow here and we were going in single file my steady old mount in the rear i could not see his face just then nor luckily could he mine i had not been so upset for many a day here was the youth to whom in fancy i had given all sorts of high destinies if only fate and fair play could pull together a boy with the face of st john and the eyes of shadrach here he was as it were sailing paper boats in a puddle and mistaking it all for a real venture on the great waters of life i was seized of course with an intense loathing and contempt for clara yet i could not hope that she was a fool as well if she could have my budding archangel have him she would i knew and yet he might be wholly in the wrong about her nature the very fact that he was attracted by her augured on second thoughts to her credit i knew that the first need of a good man doing good work was the possession of the right woman as standard-bearer and what manner of thing was clara at heart yes all depended on the woman i must see her i must go to littlecot and judge for myself we had come out into a little clearing a sort of deep well in the wood a disk of blue sky overhead fringed about with the ragged gold of the elm tops and below the red bracken up to our horses knees i put forth a hand and stopped the boy now look here you were in earnest were you not when you asked my counsel on this matter yet you seem to have made up your mind before i have had the chance to say a word you are going much too fast i am a good deal older than you and the older a man gets the more he realises the importance of this business of falling in love in more senses than one it is a matter of life and death for this reason alone it is impossible for me to advise you until i have thought the whole thing out carefully and that needs time now will you really trust me as a friend and if you are willing for that will you promise me that you will do nothing and write to no one until you have had a letter from me remember that on what comes to pass within the next few weeks or days perhaps may depend not only your happiness and success in life but clara's as well keep that in mind and wait as patiently as you can until you have read and considered what i will write to you for i may be able to help you more than you think sitting alone in the inn at tytherley a little later over a quiet cup of tea i was able to enjoy a new sensation in my travels that of having something to do awaiting me on ahead i found from the map that littlecot lay about five miles south-west of winchester not greatly out of my way 
by pushing on to-night as far as i could conveniently get i might easily reach littlecot in the afternoon of the next day but that would be saturday and i had long promised myself a rest on sunday how would it do i pondered to break my rule for once as to a village route and to spend sunday in the old cathedral town so i arranged it therefore and having got that off my mind i strolled out to take a look at the village it was just on the verge of twilight behind the woods the clear western sky glittered like a sheet of gold foil with a single pale star marking where the gold faded into the grey above in the east the moon was brightening a perfect human face deprecatory supercilious rather stupid there was no direct light only this stealthy contention of silver and gold upon everything that was neither of the night or day perhaps if i ever go back to tytherley in broad noon i shall find it bereft of the enchantment almost the intoxication it had for me on that mystic wan november evening but as i saw it then it might have been a mirage picture thrown from fairyland in that twofold light every cottage seemed of an unearthly perfection in colour and form and each one grouped with its neighbours in a composition ravishingly beautiful yet looking as if it owed its existence to the touch of some magician's wand the old grey church among its high elms seemed no mere church of stone but a living watchful thing at once mourning and rejoicing a herd of cows winding slowly through the street lost their reality and became only coloured shades that formed and faded and formed again under the glowing obscurity overhead in the elfin sky swept company after company of starlings incredible numbers of them whirring vast multitudes going straight for the cover of the wood i could not believe them to be mere birds in that radiant transforming dusk they were more like spirits of darkness each bringing his little swart distaff that together would weave the mantle of the night in this topsy-turvy mood i had wandered the length of the village street put about dreamily and come idling back towards the inn a curious vehicle had arrived in my absence it was much like the gypsy's caravan which i had encountered at kingston deverell but infinitely more respectable it was dark and shiny and covered all over with big white letters bible texts of the most combative kind as i was trying to decipher these in the fast gathering darkness i became aware of a black figure at my elbow and a friendly voice remarking on the beauty of the night in the glow of the van lamps i made out a tall trim young clergyman whose teeth and eyeglasses flashed pleasantly as he peered into my face perhaps said he pulling on his gloves you will be kind enough to direct me to king somborn i have a meeting near stockbridge to-morrow and must get on thus far to-night but dear me i am very sorry i mistook you for the hostler he was here a moment ago now half an hour earlier i had myself been inquiring of the landlord the way to that very place i was therefore fully primed sir said i doffing bonnet to him i know the way very well and am myself just starting for the same place on foot you must take the left-hand road veer to the right and then 
here he interrupted me which truth to tell was what i had counted on why how very lucky would you have any objection to taking a seat on the van i am quite alone besides my old horse and i are nearly as blind as bats and we shall be glad of an extra pair of eyes that was one of the sweetest times i spent on the entire journey the missionary van had easy springs and we crept along through the moonlit lanes at the gentlest pace i found the missioner full of thoughtful good things altogether a splendid travelling companion but his greatest charm was his power of silence he had a way of conversation wholly independent of speech so that time and again without a word between us i knew that the same thought was stirring in both our minds king somborn must have been six or seven miles away and i enjoyed to the full a good two hours of this eloquent mute companionship that he found pleasure in it too i had in the end sufficient testimony drawing near to the village at last he turned to me with the friendliest of looks we are wesleyan folk you know he said i am to seek out a good brother here who is to let me pitch for the night in his meadow but how are you going to fare i told him that there were no less than three inns so that he need not fear i should lack accommodation but look you he urged we have not talked half enough and i have set my mind on showing you the very passage in a kempis that you disputed there is a vacant berth in the van and plenty of blankets why not accept a lonely man's hospitality and thus it came about and in the midst of that quiet night i woke gazed out through the little foot-square window-hole at the stars and lying long awake thought at last i could hear the winter slow sheep bells silvery and slow on the first soft breath of the morning End of chapter 16chapter seventeen of lift luck on southern roads by tickner edwards this librivox recording is in the public domain a start in the cold the meadow where our van had brought up for the night lay a little to the west of the village my first view of king somborn by daylight therefore was obtained as i passed through it going as usual eastward after taking reluctant leave of my kindest of hosts there was a freezing wind half a gale perhaps blowing from the north and though the sun shone it was but intermittently its colourless beams piercing here and there the high white vapours that drove across the sky whether it was due to the cheerless light or the harrying ill humour of the blast or the fact that i was once more turning my back on a new one but already valued friendship i did not pause to inquire i am willing now to believe that these alone were to blame for it but king somborn by no means favourably impressed me it seemed an arid glum cold-hearted place its one serpentine thoroughfare was too wide giving to the houses on the two sides of the way an air of being on only distant terms of acquaintanceship beside the parish church several small places of worship variously labelled stood at different points in the street indicating a more subtle disrelationship i turned up my coat collar buried my cold hands deep in my pockets 
and trudged on deciding that king somborne lacked the humane pull-together spirit was inclined to cliques and petty variances and was a place to get out of in such a mood and on such a morning with all convenient speed a mile or so beyond the village i overtook a cart piled high with babbins a dark and melancholy load on the top of the brushwood lay the driver with his chin in his two fists and a tobacco pipe sticking out between them i could see no more of him for his big slouch hat by this time i had walked myself into a glow of mind as well as body and had got back something of the old wayfaring spirit as i passed under the rustling cargo of babbins i sheltered up the usual word of greeting and would have gone on but the cart stopped an unshaven jolly face looked down upon me what say mister i said it was a rough morning oh ah i see i thought as ye wanted barley money mint farley what the money mint that there atop of farley hill as the folks comes so fur to see what sort of folk he looked me over rather disdainfully ah well not your sort in general but tis a grand sight for them as knows summat what is there to see then see he gazed dreamily over the landscape for a moment ah i believe ye never north and like it afore and never again i'll lay but won't you tell me about it why is there a monument there he took his pipe from his mouth and pointed it at me impressively tis no good talkin on it ye must see it for yourself now i be goin there along git up mister and welcome they hold o that there rope now one foot on the shaft and t'other on the foreboard so tis give me a hand sharp sticks ay and there ye be comfortable as a king on a castle go on jerry i lay down upon my buttons in imitation of the babbin man in fact it was the only safe posture on that swaying trembling height then i found it difficult to hold my head up without support so i got my fists under my chin as he was doing the strong cold wind threatened to bear my cap away i had to pull it over my eyes from that to the pipe was an easy and natural transition so there were a pair of us voyaging down the hampshire lane a fellow feeling making him at least wondrous kind but i could not extract another word as to the monument mystery he parried all questions with the same good-humoured shrug and wave of his pipe obviously he had a sense of the dramatic and wished the revelation whatever it might be to come on me with all the telling force of a surprise jerry toiled up a steep lane with us into a village which the babbin man told me was ashley a little bevy of comfortable human nests all deep in the wild wood and lowered us gently down the farther hillside the road got narrower the deeper we went a grassy track sprang up in its centre the surrounding country took on an unkempt backward-like appearance a ragged out at elbows beauty such as i had met with nowhere else a peculiar feature of the road was its straightness it took rise and hollow with the same direct imperturbability going right ahead towards a steep hill as though it would gather impetus for the climb i did not know it then 
but afterwards i learned that this was one of the ancient roman thoroughfares the work of a people whose every thought and act seemed to have run in straight lines at the foot of the hill however the road threw off a side stalk and here the babbin man stopped he was in quite a glow of exhilaration look ye now said he this here be my way and that yawn you keeps along fur's top of the hill and you goes through that there little small copse place and when you comes out on pit down why there tis right afore your eyes he lowered me down the scratchy sides of the babbin pile chuckling richly all the time as i went up the hill i could hear the same fat chuckles behind me and just before i got to the trees he shouted something which i could not catch he shouted it again where chalk pit i looked about for pitfalls but there was nothing of the kind whereupon he sent up to me a final bellowing laugh and drove off with the sense that i was being made the butt of some local jest i pushed on through the little wood and out upon pit down there was the monument sure enough it was a sharp pointed pyramidal thing about twenty feet high standing on a round grassy knoll like a prehistoric tumulus this itself forming the summit of the highest part of the down drawing nearer i could see that there was some sort of inscription on the pyramid and coming nearer still this is what i read underneath lies buried a horse the property of paulet st john esq that in the month of september seventeen thirty three leaped into a chalk pit twenty five feet deep a fox hunting with his master on his back and in october seventeen thirty four he won the hunter's plate on worthy downs and was rowed by his owner and entered in the name of beware chalk pit pit down was a bleak and barren and lonely spot the north wind careered over the green waste of it hissing like surf in the dry grass bents underfoot my curiosity as to the monument was soon satisfied and i turned my back on it making off down the road with head aslant in the fierce crosswind but the day was gradually bettering the sky was clearer there were quick sharp bursts of sunshine now and again and the birds were plucking up heart to sing i covered perhaps a couple of miles of that undeviating roman track and then tired of the strife of the wind resolved to give up the fight for a little while here the hedgerow was dense and high i sat down under the lee of it mopped the tears from my cheeks and got out my largest and most consolatory pipe it was wonderful what a difference the thick holly hedge made the wind charged overhead like a regiment of cavalry but below i sat in almost perfect calm in addition to this the sun now swam into a clear space of blue and struck down on me with a generous warmth cheer up it seemed to say it is only november for all it is so cold and if you begin to shrivel up now at the first unkind breath what will you do when winter comes and there is really something to complain about i have no patience with you mortals you have no more heart now than a nightingale i remember the time when you went barefoot in half a goatskin and there wasn't a wind in heaven that could daunt you but nowadays you swaddle yourselves inches thick in wool all the year round 
and shiver to death every time a bit of cloud gets in my eye the fact is you don't fight enough that was the way men used to warm themselves and each other in the brave old days and there is nothing like it properly done but you moderns make even fighting a dead cold business once upon a time it was hard hot work killing at the end of it killer and killed were about equally out of breath but in these silk mitten times you must stand two miles off and slay your man with the wag of a finger no wonder you think it a vain and unsatisfying world i had no quarrel with the world myself by then sitting in the snug hedgerow shelter regaling on the two best things in life tobacco and sunshine to my soul's content up in my green chimney top the wind roared harmlessly on the road before me the leaves twirled by on edge there was a glimpse of distant violet dell and wood and clustered cottage easily in my range of view for the trouble of a little neck craning and every moment a lark got up in the fallows behind me singing as though it were an april day i felt a little ashamed of my late want of sturdiness as i listened the world was still full of the sunbeams that had soaked into it all the summer through this was only a cold snap in early november and well the larks knew it they had not silenced their merry pipe though at the first chill floor i was as mute as a moulting owl and now in a break of the lark music there was borne to my ear another kind of singing i looked down the road and beheld a man striding along a ragged man with a basket on his back and long hair and beard blown about by the wind he had his arms behind him and his eyes in the sky and was chanting a wild weird melody as he came he did not see me lying in the brown fern under the holly and doubtless would have passed by if i had not hailed him on such a journey as engaged me then one grows instinctively shy of the professional tramp not one in a hundred has anything farther to recommend him than an occasional coarse or slinking humour and a more than occasional thirst but this tousle maned minstrel with the basket somehow appealed to my fancy i called to him that it was weary work travelling on such a blusterous morning and invited him to sit down with me a while and rest the song ceased the singer stopped looking at me for a moment in dark suspicion wild eyes he had and an undeniably dirty face he wore a black felt hat much battered and incredibly high in the crown loose triangular tatters fluttered all over him like the bunting on a dressed ship while he stood glowering at me the wind seized the hat and all but made off with it its owner recaptured it deftly in mid-air and crammed it down again over his ears but not before i had had an impressive view of an enormous dome-shaped bald head he still hesitated it is sheltered here said i persuading him it is warm and dry we are both solitary travellers and a man is all the better for a little company once in a way come sit you down and let us talk of life and love poverty and freedom old songs and old times and forget a while the wind the world and the devil it was a lucky hit a smile transfigured his dark face he drew suddenly nearer listen said he a hand tremulously raised 
i was singing it just now and i call it the golden gibbet god hid it deep in the kind dark earth the yellow devil made glittering dross unfired unminted nothing worth and satan mourned his loss i'd have made of it such a lurk quoth he as had lured all men to the gallows tree tis deep tis dark tis hard to find no mole is man to look for it there thus spake the serene eternal mind while there's living gold in the air green earth and azure and golden sun what can they buy sneered the evil one the devil he dug the whole world through but found only iron or copper or lead at length to the country churchyards drew and grubbed among the dead i never thought of sacred ground quoth satan now tis found tis found the golden gibbet groans in the wind widow and orphan are sore oppressed greed drives the coach and up behind vice stands in satin dress gold coach gold scourge gold gallows tree but god's son gold for you and me he sang it in a voice husky yet rich and deep and well produced he beat time the while with his upraised hand when he had done he sat down beside me his lean fingers clasped round his knees you love music he asked suddenly after a mute interval ah if i had my guitar here and my voice but they are both gone years ago i did very well then made all my own songs and travelled far and wide singing my bread and butter out of people's pockets lord what a brave time that was now life is all silence and watercresses he was arranging the little green sodden bundles in his basket as he spoke he fell to humming absent-mindedly <laughs> and gradually the humming became articulate he burst forth again if for a year and a day you were given the round of sway the seat on the pearly throne all human souls for your own legions of angels to work your mind what would you do for poor mankind would you give back the dear lost dead to lonely hearts that bled youth to the stress of years joy to unquenching tears and love grown cold in the dust of the earth would you quicken it to a second birth to the starving children food grace to decrepitude sunlight to the blind faith to the doubting mind would you grant to the toiling throng and prayers the boon of eternal idleness 
Nay, through the din and strife, you would see but the one ill life. For loveless, joyless, poor, world weary and heart sore, guiltless pain and dwindling faith, but the one true panacea death i had listened first with astonishment and then with a certain uncanny dread pricking in my scalp there was no mistaking the power of the man he sang quietly enough but with an underswirl of emotion breaking the calm surface of the music with fierce little cat's paw crests and the tune itself was all hopeless sadness it was pitched in a minor key with a drooping refrain at the end of each verse that took the very colour out of the sunshine come now i remonstrated sitting up uneasily you never won your bread and butter out of such mournful atheistic stuff as that and a guitar too why there is only one kind of song that could go with its passionate music was there no springtime and were there no lads and lasses in your day to call the tune it is true said he after a pause i made that song long after and the old guitar never heard it ah but it heard a good many of the sort you mean there was one i you would not think i had ever been good-looking would you yes assuredly and full of hope and rich young blood never a doubt and all in all to a woman and she to me i was silent but he seemed to press for an answer well all these are links in the same chain of life and he caught me up a chain yes and the chain of life generally breaks doesn't it somewhere or other because there is always a weak link one could make a good song out of that he sat so long with his fingers hooked round his knees and his eyes on the horizon that i began to think that he had forgotten all about the old song in pursuit of the new but he came back to the subject presently yes that was a brave bit of work and many's the shower of coppers it drew but the first time i sang it i got more than money though there was only one to listen just make believe that you can hear the old guitar throbbing and sobbing and you'll understand it better he sat still as stone but for the heave of the rags on his breast the music in him welled up and overflowed i had never heard so restrained yet so passionate a delivery i must pass on the lonely road the stranger crowd for me if love but waved one rosy plume twere more than misery more than the strife of wind and rain the sleety tempest roar farewell sweet eyes of tender blue i dare not see you more wearily drearily why is the sun so bright if hearts but me to part again twere better sullen night when first i saw your lily face amid the gaping crowd the song it died upon my lips my heart cried out aloud for home and ruddy ingle nook for joy of wife and child 
and never more to wander in the naked cheerless wild wearily drearily why shines the sun so bright if eyes but me to glance away twere better sullen night o oh, snow-white maid of summer said why linger cruelly near i sing for bread and music bought and sold is doubly dear when all the april woods are blithe with heaven's music free why listen while a huckster drives his trade in melody wearily drearily o oh callous glittering light if hearts but meet to part again twere better sullen night the song is done the staring crowd have gone to home and in none but the dust grime minstrel lingers on the village green none as he turns to wander on at plodding nomad's pace there are the eyes of tender blue the snow pure lily face sweet and grave shyly brave o oh glad transforming light where love and pity interlave there's neither death nor night lie little shining silver piece on my heart for evermore stamped with a queen's head gift of a queen dearer than miser's store i'll sing for you i'll live for you in the same grave we will lie and wait till those eyes of tender blue win back to their native sky joyous rain love's refrain in storm or glad june light and love in the toil of the sodden lane the chill of the winter's night the words died away in the roar of the wind overhead long we sat together mute in the sunny tranquillity and then he changed a sigh into a cough <clears throat> the weak link he muttered it is always the weak link that spoils everything for it looks as strong as all the rest you never know till it breaks and the irrevocable has come to pass ay i must make a song out of that he was fumbling in his coat pocket while he spoke and now produced a hunk of bread and cheese done up in an old newspaper dinner time said he apologetically he talked on as he ate telling me tales of the road of his adventures of odd people he had met but he said no word more about the maid of somerset and i could not question him when he had finished his meal he stretched himself out on the grass and fell to studying the newspaper with that curious hat like a heavy gun projectile pulled down over his eyes as for me i sat in the warm sun considering many things it was a little black box of a cart which i now beheld creeping down the road towards us that finally got me out of my difficulty as it drew nearer i saw that the man sitting in it was as black as the cart and the pony in the shafts perhaps the blackest of the three it was a chimney sweep going his country rounds and now luckily wending in my direction i scrambled to my feet 
i must be going now said i to the whilom minstrel for here comes my carriage shall we do a little trade together by way of good-bye will you sell me that newspaper he looked at what i held out to him and hesitated but it is quite worth it to me i urged getting hot all over you shall see it will save me double and treble its cost hi will you give me a lift along the road the sweep pulled up with a broad grin there's room he said and soot bags is soft to sit on ah that bain't an ill notion ye'll ride clean enough now the newspaper was a twenty-paged one it would have lined the whole cart if that had been needed i made a travelling rug as well as a cushion cover of it and away we went i found the sweep communicative enough on the matter of his own calling at any other time i should have been glad to learn all i could about a trade of which i knew only little but my head was still full of the maid of somerset i could hear nothing but that yearning ardent music and think only of the story but half revealed to me by the words of the song in this preoccupied state of mind we had ambled along some miles before it occurred to me to ask whither we were going down by lilcurt returned the sweep in rather an injured tone guessing apparently for the first time my indifference to his conversation down by where i asked brought suddenly to attention lilcurt repeated the sweep more shortly than ever little cot that is where you see they red chimney-pots and the flag flyin so i was close to the place where lived my little postmistress clara and as yet i had formed no plans had given hardly a thought to the matter of my promise to the lovesick groom the day before farley monument and the watercress man had driven the thing completely out of my mind End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of lift luck on southern roads by tickner edwards this librivox recording is in the public domain at little cot inn little cot i found lay up a side lane close by the great main road to winchester it missed the din and dust of the highway only by a few hundred yards but in itself was quiet enough sitting at lunch in the common room of the inn by the open window i could hear the low roar of the motor traffic afar off a deep sound much like that of a busy london street but lacking its continuity here it was a pulse beating strong yet slow it came and went with a strange regularity there was always the rushing mighty voice of the wind in the trees but this voice deepened to bass then back again to its hissing tenor as each motor swept by for the first time on my ramble i found myself listening to the noise of mechanical traffic almost with pleasure so rhythmic and restful was the sound out again in the frolicking sun and shadow of the street i looked about me for the post office i soon found it it was a queer old house with latticed casements above and bull's-eye panes in the lower windows here the only sign of postal business was a letter-box the windows being filled with the usual heterogeneous wares of a village shop rather undecided as to what lay before me i first strolled by on the opposite side of the way then crossing the street i came back to the little shop and fell to studying the contents of the window 
the shop seemed outrageously dark within i could see nothing but what lay immediately under my eyes bacon candles corduroy trousers sheep dip linen drapery all the usual happy family of village needs but just as i was meditating another quiet turn down the road still undecided as to procedure the sun came sparkling out behind me and one rich yellow beam struck into the gloom of the shop i all but started back right in its dazzling path stood a figure that of a tall bright happy-looking girl she had but just risen from a little desk at the counter where she had been writing she stood quite still in the sun her brown eyes meeting its rays unflinchingly every little detail of her face was revealed to me with microscopic clearness her ruddy cheeks and lips her firm brows her dark abundance of hair flowing back from the high forehead and she was laughing about something the conviction fell upon me that it was at sight of my own face pressed upon the glass no doubt she had been watching me all the time there was only one thing to be done putting on my most benevolent most fatherly air i opened the door of the shop and went in i bought stamps picture postcards note paper a pencil i did not want finally asked permission to write a letter at the little desk and all the time i was falling head over ears in love with clara she seemed so merry and winning and frank she had such a fund of talk such an artesian well of laughter at the smallest pleasantry was so genuinely happy to help a stranger in his need for local information that presently i was vowing in my heart that no swashbuckling soldier should ever have her but that she should mate with my young archangel of the forest if i had to stand guard at the door until he came and took her off to church but what could i really do to further the matter very little it seemed to me as i sat ostensibly busy on my writing but actually studying clara out of the tail of my eye as she went about her work in the shop i had a forlorn hope at first that i might lead her on to making a confidant of me as the young groom had done in that event my task would have been easy but obviously this was the last thing in the world likely to happen she was certainly not in love with any one nor had she a care in life to judge from her bright contented face what if i told her all about the conversation in the wood and urged her to make her young suitor happy in the only way that happiness could ever come to him i knew that being a woman this would infallibly decide her in the opposite way i spun my letter out to an unconscionable length i finished one sheet and began on another i gnawed the end of the penholder to shreds at last i sorrowfully gave up the whole business kismet said i half aloud wholly in desperation and all the time the very thing that i wanted lay in the palm of my hand clara had gone to the shop door and looked up the street looking for whom i asked myself yet needing no answer now she came towards me bringing a piece of blotting paper i lifted my hand with the thing in it it was a paper weight with which i had been toying all the time one of a not uncommon pattern a ball of glass embedded in a plinth of some dark shining wood what do you use this for i asked her she gave me a laugh and a look 
what should i use it for said she it keeps the papers from flying away when the door is opened and ah but it can be used for a very different purpose don't you know that some people can tell fortunes by looking into a glass ball like that again the little dark shop rang with that merry laugh and if i had ever been in doubt of the wisdom of my purpose i was in no sort of doubt then in the midst of her merriment she became suddenly grave can you do it well i have often tried sometimes i have succeeded and sometimes failed would you like me to see if i can tell your fortune she looked back into an inner room apparently to assure herself that nobody was within earshot it is rather stupid isn't it i shouldn't believe a word of course it is all nonsense do try will you just close your hands over the ball for a minute so now give it to me and you must keep quite quiet while i look into it years ago i had seen a professional crystal gazer at work so i was well up in the business i looked solemnly down into the ball there is nothing yet said i after a long pause it is all cloudy ah now the clouds are beginning to move they seem to be clearing yes i can see something now i can see some figures men i think but it is too misty yet yes there are two two men one is much higher up than the other oh i can make it out now one is on horseback and the other walking by his side there the clouds have come back i can see nothing there was no laugh now the girl leaned her hand upon the desk the desk trembled do look again do please i bent to the pious deception once more renouncing my own philosophy as to means and ends it is still cloudy no there is nothing at all wait though the clouds are moving again there is only one figure now no there are two but the horseman has fallen far behind he is only a speck in the distance the man in front is walking fast i can make him out quite plainly he carries a little cane and has a funny-looking cap on his head he seems to be dressed in dark clothes ah now i see it is a dark green uniform he is a soldier a burly young man with oh how provoking the clouds have rolled over the picture again and hidden everything i stole a look at clara's face here the colour on her cheeks had all centred into two bright patches and she was biting her lip as i could have sworn with vexation go on do look again that cannot be all you can never tell you know sometimes it leaves off just like that and nothing comes again but i will try i let some moments pass while i stared into the depths of the crystal the little shop was quiet as death but for the girl's quick breathing when i judged her sufficiently primed i got to work again now the mist is moving moving fast there is a figure yes it is the soldier again and still alone i cannot see the horseman wait it is so misty behind he may be only hidden ah now he has come into full view he is much nearer he is catching up the soldier again now he is abreast of him has passed him is pressing on in front 
ah the soldier has lost the race and no wonder he is hopelessly in the rear why he has stopped turned and gone back and the horseman is coming on faster than ever now i can see his face what a handsome young fellow there is something hanging from his saddle peak something bright and red but the mist is gathering so i can scarcely make out oh yes now i see it is a bunch of red flowers roses i think but it is all getting so vague ah the clouds have come up i can see no more it is finished i put the crystal aside and turned again to my letter for a full two minutes clara stood at my elbow like a woman changed into stone then she backed slowly away <laughs> you are a wizard said she after a while with a little high-strung nervous laugh i'm frightened out of my wits but of course it is all nonsense oh very likely i returned as casually as possible looking up from my writing and i should advise you not to give it a single serious thought the present is far too important in life for us to bother about the future i hastened to add a postscript to the letter remember not a word to her about our meeting at tytherley nor of your having ever seen or heard of me in your life all's fair in love or war you are to come to little cot at your usual time on sunday afternoon and whatever you do do not forget the roses she may or may not tell you of the visit of the elderly gentleman who discovered such surprising things in the paperweight i think she will keep this a secret for ever or at least for the next week or two but if she does tell you be sure to look sufficiently astonished and now i must get a lift into winchester as quickly as possible to post this letter good-bye my dear boy go in and win and good luck to you and god's blessing on you both End of chapter 18